Uh, just for the record, Octavius, uh, the bench is, is global. Uh, we operate in four very, very specific sectors in construction, mining, steel, and manufacturing. And historically, construction has been regarded as one of the least transformed sectors in this country. And a couple of months ago, I was in Cape Town addressing the conference as well, and there was a speaker prior to me that was coming from the DTI, and she made mention of that. And I asked her very politely to stick around until I was done. And, and obviously in the next two to three hours, I changed her mind about what actually construction does. Simply because a bench has actually done phenomenally well over the last three to four years. Now, four years ago, I had the displeasure of inheriting the, the transformation portfolio. I was in procurement, I was given the title of Group Executive for Procurement for, for Transformation, and I inherited a sinking ship. The company was on its way to a level six, which means they would not have been able to trade, especially in the sector, especially with government work. And, and I also inherited a procurement structure which was not delivering on the ESD side of it. Okay? Now, my biggest challenge was not to take boxes. I refused to take boxes, I refused to go to, uh, down the motion of saying, let's outsource, let's do all kinds of stuff, let's find black companies and throw business away or throw money away. My job was to actually create a sustainable process which resulted again two days ago, the bench retained its level two overall B rating, we just about missed a level one, and, and my challenge is over the next few months is to actually get us back to a level one. Now, what happened in that space of time? If we look at four years ago, not more than 5 to 6% of our suppliers were black on. Not more than about 3 to 4% of those were actually EMEs and QSEs. And so that was a major crisis. The ESD programs, the Enterprise Supplier Development Programs, was box ticking exercises. We were throwing money to earn 15 points. And each year after the financial year end, on the first day of the new financial year, zero points on the table, zero sustainability, nobody heard from those suppliers ever again. All of that resulted in a transformation team which was now left with the mountain to climb. So what did we do? A number of things changed. One, my reporting line is directly to the CEO. So it talks again about leadership commitment, it talks about direction from, from the top, and I had the full support of the board. That made a huge impact in terms of what I was trying to achieve. A couple of years down the track, the CPO decides to resign, and I get thrown with a curveball by the board as well, and I get told to take on the role of CPO as well. So I have a very fancy title, okay? So I head up both procurement as well as transformation for the events group, as well as I also chair the events community trust, which focuses on SED type activities. So being in charge of transformation gives me access to all the, the, the facility, or all the elements of, of the scorecard. Now, in terms of, and again, ignore the slides, because I generally tend not to talk to the slides, and I tend to go all over the place. So what do we do? What do we do from a, let's start with the provincial procurement point of view. And this is where the sharp challenges came out from an organization like the bench. 98% of our procurement decision makers did not have a clue what preferential procurement was about. They did not believe that they were accountable or even remotely responsible for transformation in the procurement space. 95% of them could not interpret the BE scorecard. They did not know what happens if they receive the scorecard that says level 1 to level 8, how we translate it into points on the preference of the procurement scorecard? Almost 95% of the entire leadership, and I'm talking top management all the way down, had never read the Code to Good Practice or the Construction Sector Charter, or did not understand everything from transformation legislation or BE legislation, to a Public Equity Act, to a Skills Development Act, they did not have a clue. So when I made a statement many years ago at a leadership conference that our BE certificate was simple luck, most people didn't believe me until I showed them the statistics. And we realized that until such time that there is entrenched accountability, that there's entrenched KPIs, that there's entrenched knowledge in the organization of the roles and responsibilities, we are going to continue failing as organizations and as a country as well. This is where the challenge comes up. Later today, I'll share with you some of the roadshows and I'll share with you some of the results, some of the surprises that, that I was able to pick up in terms of what people's mindsets were and how we go about changing that. Now, from an enterprise, enterprise and supply development perspective, Avenge had, five years ago, 100 beneficiaries. That's what I inherited. 
The day I took over, all the contracts had expired. They were all in the spaces of cleaning, grass cutting, stationery, all kinds of nonsense. And what is the rule? When we talk about substance over form in terms of transformation, what is the rule? The rule is very simply to transform the sector within which you operate. So we are predominantly a construction company, even though we have other sectors. We earn more than 60% of revenue from construction. But we were not developing a single construction subcontractor or a construction company. Now, the question came up as to whose responsibility was it? I said to bench corporate, is it a bench construction? Is it the projects? Is it the sites? And we have sites right around the globe. Whose responsibility is that to, to, to transform? And everybody assumed it was mine. Okay? So whilst I am responsible for the overall direction and strategy for transformation for the events group, I am not held accountable for the actual performance. Sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? Okay? I am not accountable. Because the accountability of the bench sits with the business unit MD. They are the guys that make procurement decisions to a certain degree on operations. They are the guys that are operating and managing the sites. They have the most opportunities to create opportunities for emerging black companies. They have the opportunities and the resources to train and develop emerging black companies. It's very difficult for me in a suit of tie to rock up on a site and try to train a black entrepreneur or even any entrepreneur for that matter. It's going to be very difficult for me to do that. People still offer people to rock up on a site with a suit of tie. So, at the end of the day, the accountability sits there. But after the first year of absolutely nothing happening, we have spectacular strategies, make no mistake. We have spectacular commitment as to where every single business was going to be. And after year one, we had zero delivery. So what happened next? So when you sit in the situation in which people are not being held to account for the, for the actions, etc. as well, the next step for us was to link it to punitive measures. It was the last straw for a company like a bank, okay? And it is now directly linked to their bonuses, okay? Transformation in the bench, and the reason we have achieved some of the results that we have, is simply because transformation targets now become the gatekeeper to bonuses. And even in loss making years, construction pays bonuses. Okay? They pay very substantial bonuses to those guys that do perform. So if we look at it in terms of what it is that we were looking to achieve, if we look at legislation, let me ask the question in the room then. Put your hands up if you've actually read the entire Code of Good Practice. Has anybody read the Code of Good Practice? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody understand how to turn that legislation into action within your organizations? Does it have the buy-in from your management and from your leadership and from your core decision makers? Because one of the biggest issues we had is we could basically go out and, and, and I mean, we can train. We can take the good school, codes of good practice, we can put it out into slides, and we can go and say this is what the codes requires you to do. But how is that relevant in your organization? How does that fit into what your company requires you to do? How does the codes of good practice impact positively or negatively on my procurement practices within the organization? Does it add or detract? And how do I overcome those obstacles? So for us, the bigger challenge was is not to regurgitate the legislation. It was to put into plan actions, policies, processes, etc. that basically made sure that people did the right thing continuously. It was embedded in policies, it was embedded in processes. So that at the end of the day, we live by the motto that transformation is the right thing to do. We do that. But we don't chase BE points. We don't chase the BE points, not once, not, not ever in the organization, whether it's in procurement, whether it's in employment equity, whether it's in skills development, or even in, in CSI or SED for that matter. We don't chase the BE points. What we are doing is we are entrenching behavior in the organization that will still give us a very good BE rating at the end of the year, as long as we continue to stick to what we did this we do. So if, if people don't stick to policies, there's repercussions for that. Okay? So we allow the correct behavior to be entrenched in the organization to make sure we get the results that we want. If we go about chasing PE points, then we'll be hiring and firing black supplies, we'll be hiring and firing black people, we'll be training all the wrong people for the wrong reasons in the organization, and we'll be throwing money at the wrong, or let's just say, uh, we'll be throwing money at, at the wrong projects in order to score ACD points. It doesn't work like that, okay? So for us, it's about entrenching the correct behavior. Now, I want to talk very, very quickly 
about what happened in the ESD space. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the ESD side. And, and later, to, uh, when I'm just about to close, I'm going to show a very, very short video on one of the projects that we're working on. Enterprise and supply development. Everybody assumed it's not our job to train black suppliers. But yet we needed them into our supply chain. We also needed competent suppliers, cost-effective suppliers, and we were not getting that. Um, and both spoke earlier on of whether or not there's a sense of entitlement coming out of black suppliers. And I get company profiles, and the first two pages, companies are simply telling me how black they are, not what they do. Okay? So I have two rules in here as well. One, if I'm going to encourage the inclusion of suppliers in our supply chain, I'm very honest with them, and I tell them what I like and what I don't like. Ultimately, it is my team that makes the decisions. We know what we want, we know when we want it, we know what prices we need to be paying in the market, etc. We are best placed to guide those suppliers as to how to enter our supply chain. Now, we took the 100 odd guys and we bought them aside. We then brought in 140 brand spanking new beneficiaries and we trained them. We prepared them to do business with the bench. And how did we do that? We used our own resources. One of the things that people have not taken advantage of over the years at the bench is the fact that we have 26 training schools or training centers, all CT accredited. The universities obviously have as a breeding ground for training, I would assume, especially with the resources and skills that you have. But we used internal people. If a subcontractor did not have the requisite safety skills to work, work on our sites, we know the rules better than anybody else. We train them. If we need the guy that needed to improve his bricklaying skills, we have a CT accredited bricklaying school. Because we train our own people. So what did we do? We used the internal resources, resource, internal skills, internal training facilities, and guess how much we spent on enterprise and supply development. Now, I'm not counting the cost of management time. I'm not going to do that. But talking physical cash. Did I take any cash out of my budget? No. Nope. Did I still get four points? Oh, yes. Okay. Because my training centers were used, my internal resources were used, we were able to, let's just say, exclude the need to go and spend the 3% of impact on EDSD but making sure we still created sustainable black-owned businesses and we pulled them in. Now, the bigger challenge for emerging black-owned businesses is access to decision-makers. The biggest challenge. They can't get through to us. They cannot get access to my procurement decision-makers. They cannot get access to me. And that has changed. And simply because we created networking opportunities. Twice a year, for example, we invite any interested EME and QSE Okay, I didn't say black. Any interested in E and QSC to walk into the event premises and meet every single procurement decision maker that we have from all parts of the country. I fly them all up to Johannesburg or I fly them into the regions if I need to as well and we have these networking sessions. What has that resulted in? Over the last few years, the spend of EMEs and QSCs now sits. 40% of our total spend is now going to EMEs and QSCs. Okay? Over 40%. We spent 4.8 billion rand with black owned EME securities last year. And it's a phenomenal achievement if you think back to three or four years ago. Have we paid more? No. We actually dropped the cost down. We actually did manage to bring the cost down. Did we suffer from a quality point of view? No. And that is something that I'll touch on later on when I talk about the perceptions around small emerging businesses, the quality, the service, etc. Now, if we look at some of the challenges that we face in terms of supplier development. As a construction entity, there is no specific construction related training center for emerging companies. So what do we do? We partnered with the DTI. The DTI currently, and I'll show you the Kuna program video very, very shortly, the DTI is currently funding an incubator program in conjunction with the bench to the tune of about 5 million rand a year. We contribute the other five. Okay? And in the process, we have 20 emerging black owned businesses, 30% of whom are black women, 40% of whom are youth, and they are receiving first hand construction training. Okay? Even late. There's no high yields, there's no nothing in there. They climb up scaffolding, they lay bricks, they plaster, they do every single thing. And they go through a three-year program of certified construction-related skills. What are we training them on? Exactly what we want on site. The business skills is exactly the kinds of businesses we want to see coming out. Now, 
Why do we train them? Why do we insist that the owner of the company undergo the training? It's very easy today for us to go around the corner, find brick, five bricklayers and say, I'm a business owner, there's my bricklayers, you're going to brickle the wall. If something goes wrong technically on the site, and you ask the owner the question, they can't answer as to what went wrong. Why is the concrete not right? Why is the cement not right? Why is the wall a bit crooked? They can't answer. So we train the owners. That is the condition that we have. Secondly, we want skilled labor on our site. So what we've done is, we've also trained for every one of those companies three additional resources coming out of a pool of unemployed local people to ensure that if they are doing bricklaying, they've got three qualified bricklayers. If they do plastering, they've got three qualified plasters to go with that. Okay? And they now enter the second phase of the program coming up very, very shortly. Now, if we look at, from a procurement perspective, the challenges that we're going to face, and I, and I know I've already been giving the, the signal out here as well, and I did say to the guys, if we're going to do this at LED, they need to give you about three hours to go through the whole program. So I'll find you guys to pick my brains afterwards as well. Now, if we look at it from a procurement perspective, and we look at some of the early conversations internally, roles, responsibilities, I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. The roles, the responsibilities, the buy-in from management. Who is accountable? Okay? Are you responsible or are you reporting into a transformation person in, within the organization? Is somebody in your organization clearly designated as the man in charge or the woman in charge of transformation? And what is that person's role? Okay? Or are you all operating with targets that says, well, we need to find black owned companies or EMEs and QSCs and we need to do ESD, but nobody's quite telling us what we should be doing. Okay? And that's what the big challenge comes up. Now, in event, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. If you have a proper transformation, even if the guys in Namibia, they pick up the phone to me. Okay? I'm the guy that will guide them on any single thing. Now, it changes the way we do transformation. And maybe something you need to look at within your own organization. The reporting lines in transformation in most companies tend to be somebody in HR. Okay? It tends to be somebody with an HR background that focuses on skills development, employment, equity. That person doesn't influence strategy. Okay? That person doesn't. And so the role within the transformation space is also changing quite substantially. My job is not simply to say I need you to find black own companies. I'll tell you why. So the question came out earlier on as to how do we overcome that? And how do we make a business case for that? And I'll share with that in the, in the afternoon session as to exactly what the business case was how we changed the playing fields and the mindset within construction to the point where a number of consultants that actually sat in on the presentation actually wanted to copy the idea, okay, and we were quite happy to let them go ahead with it as well. But at the end of the day, I can change transformation, I can change procurement strategy simply because I know procurement. I can change transformation strategy because I know transformation. That is the challenge that we're sitting with, okay? Because nine times out of ten, a transformation person will say to you, you need to improve your score in black-owned EMEs. And everybody looks at them and says, well, what does that mean? What do we need to change? Um, Petra spoke earlier on about understanding your spend. We know in a bench exactly what our spend is. We know exactly what we need to move, where we need to move it to, what needs to go into the local areas, and what needs to change. So if we look at, for example, the need for designated group, which is now a latest measurement that came out, how do we tackle that? We run training schools in local communities. Okay? We run three-day sessions at least three to four times a year, where we actually go out and train. And why do we do that? Most companies will tell you, we don't have the budget to train, we don't have the money to train, we don't have the resources to train. But yet, if we look within our organizations, the resources are there. One of the things that I do uh, quite, quite nicely is when I do internal discussions amongst my peers, nine times out of ten, I'll find somebody saying, how do I get involved? I love those guys. Simply because I know I can now take them out and help them to train. So when my safety guy says, how do I get involved? And say, come and train the guys on safety. If my, the, my strategic sourcing guy says, how do I get involved? Train SMMEs on how to do better procurement. If my legal guys put up their hands, let's talk to them about contractual issues and how they deal with that. So those are the kind of things which is simple training that you can do. To give you an idea, we train our SMMEs on how to present their companies. We give them presentation skills. We proofread everything through their, 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 their company profiles. We edit it. We make it stand out. We train them on procurement. We train them on sales. We train them on marketing. We train them on communication. We train them on legal. Okay? We train them on continuous improvement. We give them training on how to transport their goods and services. We train them on how to sell the companies, including through the tender process, into a bench. We train them on our own tender process. 
and we still give them networking opportunities. Then we have the secondary part, where we train them on technical skills for those that require it through our own training centers. Okay? Throughout the entire process, with the exception of being, being using or using up our own training centers, using our own internal resources and maybe contributing to lunches and meals, etc., I haven't contributed much into enterprise supply development. Yet we've trained over 2,500 emerging black-owned businesses, over 30% of whom have actually physically entered our supply chain in the last three years. We use internal resources, which is one of the biggest challenges. Again, to answer the question around management buy-in, if I went to the board every single time and said, I want 10 million rand for, for enterprise and supply development, I'll be told to take a hike, okay? Because that's a lot of money. But if we focus on the challenges of how we utilize internal resources, if we look at what the DTI contributes to us right now, we focus on the, the fact that the DTI actually costs, covers the cost of our training centers. It covers the cost of my training centers every single time, and the money is refundable. Okay. So, if we look at, again, the code of good practice, if you haven't gone through it, if you haven't translated it into actionable, sustainable decisions within your organization, and the people within the organization are aware of the KPIs, what is it that they need to do, how they need to go about doing it, and make sure that they are powered to do that. There's no point in telling, me telling my procurement team that I need more QSEs, but I don't allow them to go out and actually make that happen. Okay? I make it happen simply because I empower them to be able to go out and make decisions. The bigger challenge that you're sitting with also as well is please make sure that you guys understand what it is they're doing and why. Okay? There is going to be challenges that you're going to face, there is going to be resistance that you face, and we'll talk about that very, very later on. I'm not going to go into this in about five minutes. Okay? I've still got 10? Okay. He says I'm good to go. All right? Now, at the end of the day, we always, we always fear New supplies. Buying one on one. How to manage new entrants into your, into your organization. It's a fear, isn't it? You don't know their quality, you don't know their prices, you don't know anything about them, and you're scared to move away from your traditional supplies. That is the biggest challenge you have. Okay? It's, it's, they always talk about better than devil you know. Now, as procurement professionals, we should all have been trained at some point in our careers on how to manage the entrance of new supplies. And I'll share with you a very, very funny story. When, when I first took on the role, part of the strategy document asked the guys, how would you deal with the risk of new EMEs and QSEs entering our supply chain? So the strategy document asked them to come up with excuses. If you think about it, right? So what is the excuses? We can't find, we can't do, we're not sure, it's a high risk, they're going to let us down, the quality is going to be poor, the price is going to be too high, the cost is going to go, all the nonsense came out. Very, very easy to do. The second part of the question, and what I did was, I changed the question. I changed a single question on the document, and, and it now read, tell me how you plan to successfully integrate emerging businesses into our supply chain. It's a vast difference from the first to the second question. Okay? It changed the mindset, and it changed the way people responded to what it is we were looking to do. And we started to see the improvement every single day. Now, when we talk about tracking, we talk about tracking. Every single year, or every couple of months, my guys will give me stats. Ten new suppliers came in. None of them had a media scorecard. Somebody's in trouble. Okay? Somebody's in trouble because it's a requirement for us going in. So, if suppliers don't know what we want, and if we are not taking accountability for them, what do we do? We share. We tell companies what we expect. There's no expectation. We share with them exactly what our process is, what our tender process is, what our site requirements are. We bring our operational guys and says, there's the supplier, tell him what he wants. Or tell him what you want on your site. Mr. Supplier, go out now and deliver. It's as simple as that. If suppliers are fully aware of our requirements, they will deliver. And we need to trust them to be able to do that. If we don't, we are always going to be operating a system that says, well, there's a new guy knocking on the door, I don't have the time for him, he doesn't understand my business. He's never going to understand your business unless you show him exactly or share with him at some point what it is that you require. That is the bigger challenge. So from that perspective, if we stop, if we don't start to engage actively with all companies. Now, when the go to practice came out four years ago, panic. Major panic, right? Everybody said, well, we're going to drop four levels. We're going to lose our BE status. We're going to become unempowered. Suppliers are going to fall massively down the road. And everybody was saying, well, we need to have a strategy, we need to hire consultants, we need to do all kinds of stuff. We didn't need to. Step number one, we simply looked at all our suppliers, 
identify those that are high risk to us going forward against a new code of practice. We called a thousand of them into the into our auditorium at work and simply said to them, there's the event three-year strategy. We want to be level four, three, two over the next three years. You are either on the journey or you're not. Simple as that. And guess what happened? Even the most resistant of our suppliers changed. They got off their backsides. A year after the codes came up, they got off their, their seats, went to the organizations, and they made sure that they aligned themselves to what we wanted. Failing which, they knew we would start to lose business, and if we lost business, so would they. It was a simple exercise. They didn't like it, especially in the Eastern Cape, by the way. The Eastern Cape, I sat in a room doing a talk on transformation, and I was the only black person in the room. Okay? And I had the most incredible resistance from the audience. And I was wondering whether I was in a foreign country somewhere where people didn't understand the legislation, which was quite an interesting discussion. But ultimately, we have now seen tremendous results coming through from this region as well. Now, at the end of the day, if we start to look at the pitfalls of success, the greed, I get emails all the time that says, I'm now doing business with your construction company, I now want to take over all the business in mining. Why do I need to caution against that? What is the biggest pitfall again of SMEs going too fast, becoming too big for the boots, not being able to manage, and let's just say, an EME, but now wants to operate and manage a generic? Do they have the right management skills to do that? We caution against that. We make sure that the growth that we give them is commensurate also with the management expertise within the organization. We make sure that they grow with the revenue that they, they're giving us as well. There is no point in me having an entrepreneur with an entrepreneurial mindset, a small business mindset coming in and saying, I want to do 50 million rand for the business here with a bet. Okay? They're not going to work. So we caution against that. We even caution them on how they spend the money. Okay? We do a lot of things in between that as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the session short. I'm going to talk at length later on about some of the mindset issues. Okay? If you don't mind. What I want to do is to very quickly share with you a video if we can go to the video on the Ikuna program and then I'll wrap it up after that. Okay? We can just roll the slides down to this one. There. I have yet. So, the, the concept behind enterprise and supply development is one which is critical to a region's um, transformation strategy. Um, I think it is an area which most corporates and most companies have failed to recognize the, the transformation imperative and the contribution that they can make to both the economy as well as um, the issue of unemployment as well as poverty alleviation. Now, Avenge recognizes the ability to make a social change and to contribute towards social change and, and has therefore entrenched enterprise and supply development as part of its overall transformation strategy. So part of the strategy has been that within the construction sector, uh, there's been public outcry, there's been uh, social outcry with regards to the lack of transformation, the lack of inclusion um, of black suppliers, black open door companies, etc. And most of that so-called exclusion has been based on the premise or a stereotype that black owned and black open door companies have either incompetent or are not yet ready to enter the construction supply chain. And part of our overall strategy is to remove those stereotypes and to prove once and for all that given the right opportunities, black companies can also thrive irrespective of the challenges that they're facing. And, and it's been an incredible journey almost of two years uh, before we could actually sign the contracts and to enter into the partnership agreement. And part of the focus going forward now is to try and create black-owned subcontractors um, that are going to be mentors, that are going to be trained, developed and given opportunities within the event as well as within the local municipalities and within the broader supply chains of other um, construction sector as well as public sector entities itself. This becomes part of the meaningful contribution, not just in, in, in the, the journey to transform the event, uh, but to con contribute to society in a meaningful manner, uh, to contribute to the construction sector. But for me personally, I think the bigger challenge is, is to lead transformation within construction. The sector has, has constantly been hampered by a lack of transformation it's, and, and, and certainly it is focused on the wrong areas of transforming the business and the way it really matters when it comes to people, when it comes to the economy etc as well, most construction sector companies have failed. Event has continued to lead the way in, in, in that aspect of it and, and it will continue to do so into the next couple of years. So Ikura is, is groundbreaking, uh, it is a game changer for the sector. 
Um, it is certainly something that has never been seen within, within the construction, uh, construction space in this country. And, and so we are quite proud of what we have achieved and, and we are looking forward to phenomenal results coming out of it. Uh, we are incredibly proud of the, of the caliber of people that we have on the program itself. And, and they are proving all that they say is wrong in terms of what they are achieving, in terms of their performance on the projects, their performance on site, of their, their willingness to be trained, their eagerness to, to, to be trained on a daily basis, etc. as well. When we started uh, with our project, and the interview evaluation process it was really important to look uh, at TCRD, uh, the best practice for contractors and qualifications needed. So along the uh, CRD lines, I've looked at that, and then of course with the, uh, with the national qualifications framework, the qualifications available uh, at that level for construction contractors. That's why I put it together and then decided it along the lines of the NQF and the CRD. The benefit to the incubators once they finish with their program, they will have the opportunity to become part of the procurement process where they can at the same time be able to get uh, jobs which they can do and also while they are still in the program itself they will have the opportunity to go on site to do some work there and that just gives them definitely an advantage. Personally, I feel this program is, is a very interesting program because if you look at how we've been doing business previously, this changes completely the way we do right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to cut the video short in this one. I don't, do know we are very conscious of time. But just to, to, to finish up as well, the 20 guys that you are currently seeing as part of the Ecoli program are now actively working on event sites. We are busy with the new intake of the next 20 people coming in. It's something we're very, very proud of. But it's something that also is only the starting blocks of what can be achieved if you put your mind to it. When we talk about the two-year journey to get it off the ground, that's how long it took me to convince management to allow me to go out and do that. Okay? So it did take me two years, it was a lot of fighting, etc. But today it's one of the programs that they stand up with pride and talk about as well. Okay. With that, I'll chat to you guys again later. Thank you very much.